Good morning. A few announcements this morning. Over on the street side, you'll find the attendance pads. Please pick those up, sign your name, and pass it across. When it gets to the other side, you can pass it back, and then you can see who you're worshiping with this morning. These beautiful flowers in front of me are from the memorial service for Lynn Thomas that was held yesterday. And let me tell you, there were not very many empty seats in here yesterday. It's looking a little sparse this morning compared to that. We had, if you weren't here, we had chairs down the aisle, we had chairs in front, and every seat in the pew was full. Beautiful, beautiful tribute to Lynn Thomas. Our prayers go out to the family today as they continue to grieve the loss of the patriarch of their family. Uh, it's next Sunday. At five o'clock, we have a potluck, and we're going to hear about uh, Wendy and, Ver and Veronica's trip to Turkey on their impact short mission. Uh, it's gonna be rather informal, uh, uh, just a chance to sit down and converse with them and find out what they did, um, what their expectations were and whether they were met and what really went on on that mission trip. So come join us next Sunday at five o'clock for a potluck, there's a sign up list uh, to put down what you're going to bring. Potluck, that means we share. And uh, <clears throat> we hope to see you at five o'clock in the fellowship hall next week. We have birthdays this week, oh my goodness. In fact, the month of August is full of birthdays. On Tuesday of this week, Chuck Stewart. On Wednesday, Priscilla Holmes and Hope Mata. And on Saturday, Eve Reeves. Pastor Bob will now call us to worship. This morning I'd like to call us our church to worship. And it's a familiar passage but I, I was pondering it this week, and I decided to bring us to worship in this passage. In Ephesians 3, verse 4, it says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even we were dead in transgression, it is by his grace that we have been saved. We have been saved to worship God. Let's pray. Our gracious God, this morning we praise you. We thank you that you've caused us to come alive in Christ. This morning may our hearts be turned to you, O oh Lord, in an act of worship of all that you are. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here's a hymn that speaks deeply of what Bob was reading. The great mercy of God, the deep, deep love of Jesus that saves us to worship him. So let's stand and sing of that deep, deep love. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus.
this morning and how it challenges us to also be loving. God shows forgiveness to us and we in turn must forgive. We in turn must show his compassion to the world. So amen to that and let's sing the compassion hymn. Show to the world 
morning we come to a time of prayer. And this morning we want to both praise God for what he is doing in our midst and also to lift up the needs and concerns that we have as a community of faith and individually. So let's begin by sharing praises of what God has done in your life this week or recently. Um, feel free, raise your hand, and we'll bring a microphone to you. Good morning. I have a wonderful praise report to bring about our Axel cousin, Steve, who you have been praying for. He is now home from the hospital, and he is doing well. He still has a long road to recovery, but his abdomen wounds are healing nicely, and he is learning to walk. And it will take a little bit of time for him to get those muscles that are left to do what they're supposed to do. But we praise God. He is a good God, and he answered our prayers, and Steve is with us as a living memory of that. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you. Praise God. Yes. Mr. John. <clears throat> Well, this week was a wonderful week for me this week because um, I heard that uh, Amazon was hiring down at their Oxnard plant in Oxnard, and I went to this agency called LR, I mean, ILRS in Ventura to help me apply online. And the next day, Friday, I got an interview, and guess what? I landed a job at uh, Amazon starting on the 17th of August. Awesome, John. Thank you, Jesus. That, that rocks, John. Anthony. Thank you very much, sir. God has been good. He's, uh, for the past couple of weeks, I've been well. You know, even back when I was getting sick a lot, uh, I never lost faith. I kept praying to God that he would make me better. And I'm going on a couple of weeks now feeling healthy and strong. And I give it to God, all the glory. And to all my friends here in the church who prayed for me over and over, thank you very much. God oh, bless you. Praise God, Anthony. God's so good. He rocks. James, I think we have. Oh, Laura. Well, then we'll be right back okay. there. I am full of thankfulness this morning for the road that I'm on with this miracle daughter of mine. Hmm. All these prayers are being answered. She's improving. And I can leave her alone for a little while and be comfortable with where she is. I am so thankful for all of you. I love you and continue to pray. We have a, a road to climb. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you. All right. Praise God. God is so good. I just want to thank God for my salvation, first of all, and just everything that he's done in my life. Um, not less than 90 days ago, I was in a prison cell and didn't know if I was going to get out of prison. I didn't know what exactly God had planned for my life, but he opened the door. He took me out of darkness. He just gave me light. He mm. started to change my life in a, in a real way. And these last three months, he's opened so many doors for me to have employment, have reunification with my family, start to, to rebuild the, the relationships I had with my children, and just restore my life from top to bottom. I, I feel like I've been given a second chance, and I really have been blessed with an opportunity to do more for God. And I just feel so fortunate, I feel so grateful because I know I don't deserve it. I know mm. that God's grace is freely given to me, and I just feel so fortunate and so grateful to have a church family here as well that prays for me and that supports me. And yeah, you guys have been such a blessing to me. So this whole experience has been a blessing. I thank you guys for, you know, giving me your smiles, your prayers, and all your encouragement. I appreciate all of it. Thank you, guys. Awesome, James. Way in the back is Lydia. Uh, I also want to thank God for all his blessings and what he's done in my family. What he's mm. done and what he's 
going to do, and, would, and I just thank him. But I, I do have a prayer request for um, Diana's co-worker that passed away suddenly. His name was Kenny. And so keep him in prayer. Well, his mother, uh, Renee, also. So the family for prayers. Would someone pray for Kenny and his family uh, when we come to a time of prayer? All right, Lydia, thank you. One more praise. Yes. Oh, Carol Boatner. Okay, thank you. Um, Carol Boatner is asked for prayers. Um, would someone pray for her this morning? Just raise your hand. Cheryl, thank you. Let's move to prayers. That was an awesome time of praise. Um, let's move to prayers that might be concerns on your heart, and we want to lift those to God. Father God, we praise you, Lord. We thank you for all the praises we had this morning. It's just so edifying to, to hear all the wonderful things you are doing. We praise you for who you are, not for what you do, but we, we love you, Lord, and we thank you for all these people that are here today believing in you, trusting in you. And uh, remembering that we walk by faith, not by sight. And Lord, we want to lift up Carol today, Carol yes, Boatner. God. Lord, you know her problem. I have no idea what it is, but Father God, I know you watch over her and, and you take care of all of us. So Lord, please uh, touch Carol with your loving hand, with your healing hand, whatever mm. it is that she needs. Would you please anoint her? And uh, bless her and lift her up, Lord, and, and heal her. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Before we go to specific prayer, are there other requests? Charlotte? And then we'll maybe two other, an, another prayer request, and then we'll go. I'd like to have prayers for my... Uh, grandson Michael he's in the hospital uh, with uh, blood poisoning mm -hmm. who will pray for Michael Rod thank you maybe one more prayer concern there you go Judy oh, um, oh I'd she like has it prayer for my dad we go to a surgeon for a consultation this Tuesday okay thank you who pray for Mao? Okay, Ron. I got Ronnie over here. All right, let's take some time and pray for those needs, and then I'll close this in the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come before your precious throne of grace, Lord, thanking you for your amazing grace and your mercy on us, Lord. Lord, we lift up this family, Lord, I can't imagine a mother losing their son at such a young age. He was only in his 30s, Lord. But you know their family, you know who they are, Lord. I pray that you give this mother the strength, the comfort, the peace that she needs, Lord. Just be with her and the family, Lord, and just bless them in a special way. Yes, if they don't know you, Lord, we just pray for their hearts that they will come to know you and put all their faith and trust in you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Father God, we lift up Charlotte's grandson this morning with the blood poisoning. Lord, we ask that you would touch his heart. Let him know that you're there. Your, your uh, love and your peace uh, your serenity, your healing powers are right there with him, Lord. He, he needs to re just reach out and, and feel your presence. And we ask that you, your presence, the Holy Spirit, would touch him and move him to a close walk with you and that it would also heal him of the blood poisoning. Guide the doctors as they treat mm. him. We ask this in Jesus' name. Father, we lift up Mal King to you. In the name of Jesus, we ask you to release gifts of healings 
to him and his body and a different, you know, the, the thing that he's concerned about, his daughters. We just ask you, Jesus' name, Lord, to give him healing grace, to fill him with the peace of your Holy Spirit, to fill him with sweet fellowship and just the overwhelming realization that you're always with him. Mm -hmm. We just thank you for healing grace in his life. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, it was wonderful as we shared our praises and we worship you in giving thanks for what you have done in our lives recently. Healings, encouragement, so many things that you do that we can sometimes miss. But Lord, help remind us of how good you are. How good is your Hesed kindness in our lives? And as James said, even though we don't deserve it, we receive it in praise and in worship. Lord, each request we give to you. And Lord, we lift up our world to you for what's going on in the Ukraine and in Russia. Lord, we pray for your peace, at least peace in the hearts of those who are hurting as a result of this war. Touch people deeply. May, you, may they see Christ in their lives and how much you love them in the midst of all this. We thank you, Jesus that you are our great savior. You usher us into the kingdom of God through faith and trust in you. And so Jesus, we not only praise you, but we come together as your people, praying the prayer that you have taught us to pray, saying our father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, and thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The passage today, Matthew 5, 38 through 48, is so wise. God has forgiven us so many times, and it's all about forgiveness of others. It says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brother only, your brethren only. What do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And thank you, God, for forgiving us.
Today I want to speak to you about, you know you're grown up and mature when, and as you've probably surmised by now, it's when you're able to forgive and be kind to people who may be against you. But before I do that, I want to just make two comments. One, please keep Joyce Carlson Rounds, thank you. Joyce Rounds. And I knew that I called Joyce Rounds. Call Joyce Rounds. Call her, tell her hi. She's right there. But I'm just snowballing now. I know, I, I know. So anyway, she's we're so sorry for your loss, Joyce. Please pray for her. And uh yeah. And then also yesterday, I was just so blessed with the memorial service here. It was so Christ-centered and God-centered, and it was just awesome to see such a stand-up guy for Jesus as we reflected on the life of Lynn Thomas, and his family did such an excellent job of honoring Christ in his life and the priority that he was. So, man, it was just awesome. Please pray for them as well, and pray for me. It looks like I need it today. So there's benign, metaphorical enemies, and then there's the serious types. Funny, benign types of enemies are, who are the enemies of the Dodgers? The Giants. The Giants. Who's the enemy of Popeye? Brutus. Brutus, or if you're old school, Bluto. And then there's the serious, not so funny at all, sad type of uh, enemies, dangerous ones like Putin, who's the enemy of Ukraine. I don't say Russia because I don't think Russia wants to fight with Ukraine, but that's just my personal opinion. But I think it's more Putin versus Ukraine. That's scary. He's putting the whole world in danger, right? Scary, serious enmity right there. And then there's sad enmity. Americans against Americans. And that's what happens in extremism. Whenever you have extremism, it creates enemies. Because if you think about it, there should be congruity, like being pro-justice and being pro-police and authority. I don't see the contradiction there, but yet you see people dividing and hating one another and calling each other enemies politically. I don't get that being mindful of the necessity of ecology and being pro-business and capitalism and freedom. I don't see the incongruity. But when you have extremism, things that really shouldn't divide people, divide people. And that's sad that America is at enmity with other Americans. I think Jesus is praying for us, hoping that we avoid extremism so that we become a country that disagrees with each other as opposed to people spreading haterade on TV, on the news, offering it like Kool-Aid to be brainwashed and to blame other human beings. It's just extreme. So there's serious, and then communities, school boards. I mean, extremism to me, again, I don't see, they're both good, safety for children, but then freedom for parents to, for parents to parent, and not to have that taken away. Both are good, right? But yet those extreme views cause enmity when really there shouldn't be any, because those are both good thoughts. Safety for children and parents being the parent, being the ultimate authority of what happens with that child. So let's think about this. The old teaching, the old teaching Jesus addresses the old teaching, then he says, but I say to you, which is authoritative. He's saying this is really what this law meant and what's behind it and the way you're to be. The old teaching. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. How how, how many of you know that the Word of God is perfect? It's the Word of God. It's not a suggestion book. It's not a recipe. It's God's Word. And God never changes. So then... Why, then, are we to take a new spin and re-understand this command? 
It's because the command was misunderstood. This command actually was helpful because it made sure that someone didn't lose their life for punching someone and causing them to lose their tooth. It preserved justice, right? Like someone doesn't deserve to be sentenced to death because they punch a fella and that fella loses their tooth. So this law originally was to protect fairness, to make sure that you didn't die and weren't sentenced to death for knocking somebody's tooth out. It protected fairness, a tooth for a tooth. In fact, we still hope that modern governments run the same, that, that punishments fit the crime, right? So this is actually a good law. But extremes, extremism, and he's thinking about the Pharisees here, and some of the governments of that time took it to an extreme. And so he says, you've heard the old teaching, a tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye, but I tell you not to resist the evil person. And then he describes three things that evil persons might do to you. People that are slapping you, taking away your property unjustly. He says, I tell you not to resist or get even is what he really means. Do not get even with an evil person. And that's the new teaching. I tell you not to resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other also. Now, in saying that, he's not saying that evil shouldn't be resisted. He's saying don't get even, really, is what in the Greek what we're to understand. Don't get even. What does God say about vengeance? Who owns it? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And so we're to resist evil and to resist bad stuff. Jesus even says, if your brother sins against you and is doing something bad to you, talk to him. Like, wake up, man. Stop this. And if he doesn't, then you go to others, two or three others. And if they don't listen, you go to the church and you bring church discipline. So evil needs to be resisted. Justice needs to be meted out. But Jesus is saying, I'm talking to you, disciples. Those of you that climbed up this hill to hear my sermon on a mount, I'm talking to you. The government is going to do that. I've instituted government, but now that you're going to be salt and light and you're going to make a radical difference in this world, you're going to be different. So, yes, the government is going to continue the ministry of an eye, eye for an eye, tooth for the tooth. The government will continue to mete out justice and resist evil collectively. But individually, I'm calling you to be radically different. I've put my heart into your heart. That's what the Beatitudes are about. You have a Beatitude heart with those seven or eight virtues. You have a new motor in you. He says, and now you're really going to shine. You're light of the world. And this is how you're going to shine, by being different. Where the rest of the world is dog eat dog you're going to be different. And how many of you know that's hard to be different? It takes a deep, deep understanding, as somebody, as Donna said, to understand how much we are loved and how forgiven we are and how kind God is to us to even begin to live out Christ's command to be Jesus to other people. And Jesus is saying, I moved inside of you, and I've given you a new heart with the seven Beatitudes now it's time to take it, take it for a test drive, this motor that I've put inside of you. So I want you to be kind to enemies, kind to people that are coming against you. Now, it's not carte blanche, because if you gave every single money, every single dollar you had to people that wanted it after a while, you wouldn't be able to, you have nowhere to live, right? You wouldn't be able to feed the piranhas at home. So he's not saying constantly, turn your left cheek, you'd have, you'd have to go to plastic surgery once a year. No, he's not saying that. But what he is saying is that there's times where God's going to put it in your heart, and we all know when he does. He says, in this instance, I want you to be a prophetic witness. I want you to show that I'm alive in your life. And there are times where God calls us to radical obedience in the form of not getting even. Again, we're called to resist, but not to get even. And so he even takes it further, the new teaching. Just in case we say, okay, 
I won't uh, run that guy over or gal over next time I see them. We kind of think, like, I could do that. But he says, no, pray for them. Do good for them. That takes it to a whole other level, huh? It does. It's an invitation to be like God, actually, because what does God do for his enemies? Well, in Romans chapter 5, it says, God demonstrates his love for us while that when we were his enemies, he died for us. So what does God do to his enemies? He loves them and dies for them and sheds his blood for them. He heals them. He fed crowds that he knew would never follow him. The Bible says friendship of the world is enmity with God. Now, I'm not going to ask you because none of you would admit it. So don't answer. But how many of you are a little bit of world, a little worldly sometimes? I'll confess for you. Sometimes I am. But what does God do to you? He fills you with his spirit. He draws you back to himself, the only one that could truly satisfy us, the only one that really could fill the emptiness of our heart, the only one that gives us real joy. After we cheat on God with persons, places, and things, he doesn't kick you to the curb. He wins you back he, by the Holy Spirit. He brings you to repentance. So when you become one with Jesus, you're one with his heart, you're one with his family, and his enemies, so to speak, are your enemies. But what does, he, what does he do with his enemies? He does good to them. And he says, Jesus says, look at nature. It rains. The sun shines on the good and the evil. The Bible says in Psalm 19 that every day the skies and nature declare and speak truth about God. The glory of God. And, and there's a lot into that. But one of the glories that nature says every day is, I love people. I love all people. White, brown, black, lazy, smart, funny, grouchy. That's what nature cries out. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He causes rain to come down on the evil and the good. We're to be like him. He says, pray for those who spitefully use you. Do good for those. Man, that's hard. We're called to be salt and light. Radically different. Because he says, if you're only good to people at First Presbyterian Church, how is that any different than, you know, he says, even the worldly people do that. If you buy dinner for people to buy you dinner, what, how, how is that different? He says, you're to be different. In fact, he says, and I'm not even going by my slide anymore, but let's go forward a slide. That way I can get back on track. This, here we go. So it's a command to grow up and mature in Christ, to put on our big boy and big girl pants. That Greek word, teleos, he says, be perfect as your father is perfect. Teleos means complete Mature doesn't mean perfect, because no one's perfect. The cross presupposes nobody could be perfect. If we could be perfect, Jesus would have stayed in heaven. He never would have died for us, never would have lived the perfect life that we could never live. He just would have said, be good. But nobody is good, the Bible says. Nobody is perfect. But Christians can be mature. Christians can be fully grown in Christ, so to speak. We never arrive until we see God face to face. But there is such a thing as immature Christians and mature Christians. And he's saying it's an opportunity to be like God, to grow up in God, to put on your big boy pants, your big girl pants, to grow up. And he says, this is an invitation with your beatitude heart, with the motor I've put in you, I live inside of you, to be a bright light and to grow up in Christ. And we know we're mature when we're able to respond to people who are unkind, vindictive, ugly to us with godliness and prayer. And I'll be the first to admit that at first when you start praying for people that are doing you bad, you feel like a hypocrite. Get all clammy, sweaty. I don't like this. 
I'm envisioning good things happening to them, them getting saved, knowing God, doing well, smiling and happy with their kids. I'm like, I don't like this movie. <laughs> I don't like this. I want you to rain down thunder on them, God, and open up the ground. Um, but then as time goes on, whether it's a week or a couple years, you begin to really mean it. Lord, bring salvation to them. Bring mercy to them. Let health come to them. Open up doors for them. And sometimes you have to do that from a distance because God doesn't call us to be abused or to be doormats. So I'll be the first to admit sometimes these prayers and doing good have to be far away, right? So that we're not codependent and putting up with abuse. But at some point, your prayer becomes genuine and you realize, one, I'm becoming healed. Two, I'm starting to become like Jesus. This beatitude heart inside of me is starting to go to my legs and my mouth, my hands. And it's an awesome thing when you start to see growth in Christ's likeness. And it's a daily going to God for his heart. Lord, fill me up. I'm on empty. Fill me up with this one beatitude of being merciful, of being kind, of being a peacemaker because I'm out of gas. And every day Jesus is there to refill us with gas because there are times at least once a year, probably more, where I'm tempted and I start to respond to ugliness with ugliness. And if you're not there, that means you've already put on your big boy pants and your big girl pants. Pray for me, I'm still putting them on. There are times it's just like a knee-jerk reaction. When someone steps to me, sometimes I, the old school comes out. Then the Holy Spirit, though, meets me and says, okay, easy killer. <laughs> you're a Christian. You're Christ's person now. So, it's awesome going to God to become what we're not. And then God promises a reward here. Loving your enemies will be rewarded. In verse 45, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. You're not, we are not loving and forgiving to become children of God. Only children of God could operate like this. But it still is a blessing, a great reward. Coming alive, no longer being dead to God, but alive to God. No longer at enmity with God in our minds. Because that's what Ephesians 2 describes us as. Enemies in our minds. Colossians 1 verse 20 the same. At enmity with God. But it's a blessing knowing that I'm no longer in my mind hostile to God. That's a great blessing. But then he gives three blessings. In verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's a reward. The earth. Blessed are the merciful. Verse 7, for they shall obtain mercy. How many of you want mercy? I don't know about you. When I stand before the throne of God, I'm trusting in the blood of Jesus because I need some passes. At a, 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 more than a couple of areas and things I've done in the past. And hopefully, God, not things I do in the future, but who knows. I'm really banking on the mercy of God. And so if I'm really believing in the mercy of God, if I really believe in forgiveness, that I'm forgiven, that God is immeasurable, the deep, deep love of Jesus, if I really believe that in forgiveness, then I'm going to be more apt to forgive others. And if I don't believe in forgiveness, then I'm not going to be on fire for God. I'm not going to have the joy of the Lord. I'm not going to be seeking God every day to grow in Him. And I'm going to be, it's going to be very, very hard and slow to be kind and to forgive other people. Because when you don't forgive, when you don't really believe in your heart of hearts that God loves you for who you are, you don't have the joy of the Lord. You don't have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You have religion. You have condemnation. You have depression. You have anxiety. When you really don't believe that God loves you. The real you. Pimples, buck teeth and all. If you're like, I believe God loves me because I went to church today. 
But, what, what, but do you believe he loves you just the same? What you're doing the opposite? He, I'm not giving you a license to do that. Please don't do that. You hurt yourself. You turn God's grace into a license to sin. You hurt yourself bad. But anyway, that's a different sermon. But God loves you. And when we really believe in forgiveness, it just flows. You're able to forgive other people. But when you still are earning your way, and you still think you're footing some of the bill of God's love and eternal life, and you make other people foot the bill, and you get disgusted with other people when you don't realize that at the foot of the cross, the person who's stolen is at the same level with the person who hasn't stolen. The person who has never wrote on a wall is at the same level with the person who's written on, on the wall. The person who's never embezzled is on the same level. We're all at the evil, even ground. And when you realize that, you're like, I can't be disgusted because when I was the enemy of God, he loved me and died for me and gave his son for me. And you believe in forgiveness. You either believe in it or you don't. And so that might be something that's blocking joy and fire and peace. So he says, verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the sons of God. So there's three blessings in the Beatitudes for people who are going to forgive, be kind to enemies. And in fact, unless you have those three motors in you, Jesus in you, you really can't do it. But then again, and I close with this, before we treat the Sermon on the Mount like a buffet line, because some Christians do, they're like, well, I'm saved by grace through faith alone, and it's optional. It's like... I'm good in this beatitude. Two helpings, please. Ooh, from Corinthians, a gift of healing. <laughs> Forgive my enemies. Uh, pass. When we, when I excuse myself, like in a buffet line, I could pick and choose what parts of God's nature I want inside of me. I really rob myself big time because then I don't get to know God and his power. I don't get to know him and his power. I just become like a Pharisee, religious. I know God stuff. I know God info. I know God tradition. But when I dare to step out on the water and say, I'm going to forgive and do good to this guy that yesterday I wanted to break a two by four over his head. The power of God meets me. The heart of Jesus meets us. The Holy Spirit meets us. And we know him profoundly. And in those things that are small to us, they're big to Jesus. This is big to Jesus. But I'll be the first to admit that sometimes we make it small. Like that's optional. When we do that, then when those big things in our life come, the huge giants, because we were afraid to fight with Pee Wee Herman over here, we couldn't believe Jesus was big enough, big enough to help us beat up Pee Wee Herman. I'm speaking metaphorically, you know, with problems, issues. I, I really, I'm not advocating violence. If we don't have faith to believe that Jesus could help us to beat up Pee Wee Herman, how are we going to face the good lives in our life? How are we going to face the big storms that come. We're going to be like everyone else. We're going to act like we don't know God. We're going to be worldly. But in the things that we deem small, which are really huge to Jesus, and we say, I want all of you, Jesus. I want to know you like Paul. I want to know you in the power of your resurrection. So yes, I'll be kind, loving, doing good to everyone in our community. Even the parts of the community that the rest of, of the city is calling a problem, a scourge, a person at your work that the boss wants to fire, a person in your family that they're making a black sheep out of. And you're like, I'm going to be like you, God. I kind of get why the city's frustrated. I get why my dad's frustrated with the black sheep. I get why the boss man or boss lady, excuse me, <laughs> is having an issue. I get that, but I'm going to see this person through your eyeglasses. I'm going to be your hands. I'm going to be your feet. And then we experience the power of God 
and then in other areas for able to believe God. I could change. I could be different. You could show up and show out in powerful ways. But when we say, nope, we're actually robbing ourselves of knowing God. And we need to know God, especially with all the pain and all the problems that human beings face. I don't know about you, but I need miracles in my life. I need breakthroughs in my life. I want to hear the Holy Spirit because I hear the junk of my emotions, the junk of the news, and I want to hear Jesus. I want to see breakthrough, revival, and it all starts by saying yes to God in all the areas of your life instead of just a couple and then realizing in the big things, I don't have any faith because I've been choosing it, piecemealing it. And now I realize I don't even have a full course. I don't really have the power of God in my life or the knowledge of God and the reality of God in my life. Heavenly Father, thank you that you're a loving God. You love people. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever believeth upon him would not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you that even though at one point we were enmity, at enmity with you in our mind, hostile toward your word, you made us your children. Help us to be like you, God. Help us to grow up and to be like you, to people that everyone else is cutting loose and labeling. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have plans for us that are for our good and your glory. You said give and it will be given to you. For in the same measure as you give, it will be given to you again. We give to you today as a response to your goodness to us. We ask that you receive our offerings and continue to supply all our needs. May your peace be in our hearts. Your grace be in our words, your love be in our hands, and your joy be in our souls. In your mighty name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing praise God from whom all blessings flow.
Now may the love of the Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit meet you every time this week you dare to live out the beatitude life and to allow the new motor installed inside of you to dictate how you live in your lifestyle. Leave here in the favor that's yours in Jesus Christ. Amen.